This is not the way to save Greece. That's what Christian Democrat politician Wolfgang Bosbach says about the third Greek bailout. He was not all that positive about previous bailouts either, but the government no longer listens to him. Welcome. How do you do? Welcome to the DW interview. I'm Thomas Spahn. Mr. Bosbach, you predicted quite accurately how things would develop in Greece. How does it feel that you were perhaps right, but no one seems to be listening? I voted in favor of the first rescue package for Greece, unlike other colleagues, who said no from the beginning. I hoped that the plan would work, with financial aid being administered step by step in exchange for reforms that would put the country back in a position to finance itself. But the situation has become more and more difficult. If you've tried several times in vain to change things, how much sense does it make to continue? Well, we'll know that in a few years. We said back then that the second bailout package wouldn't be enough, and there would have to be a third. That caused trouble. Now a third package has been approved. Anyone who now says, mark my words, Greece will need new funds again in a few years, will be criticized just like back then. It's something like being in the Groundhog Day movie. But I know that in the end, it's not a matter of who's right, but who commands the majority. It's clear you don't have that. You've already said, I don't want to be the big bad bear. I don't want to be the cow that keeps kicking over the pail of milk. You're considering giving up. Up. How unfair does that seem when you see your predictions realized, when it seems you were right? I'm a complete realist there. I know the majorities within the parliamentary party. I don't have any illusions at all. I know that there are many colleagues who share my views, but nevertheless say yes, because for them, it's also an expression of loyalty towards the government. They'd like to support the finance minister and the chancellor and express that by saying yes, although they may be as skeptical about the issue as I am. If your own arguments are so strong, why do you want to step down as chairman of the Internal Affairs Committee? Because I know that I don't owe my mandate to the parliamentary party, but to my voters in the Rheinisch-Bergisch constituency. Heading the Internal Affairs Committee is one thing. I owe that to the parliamentary party. I can understand if someone says, a person who is responsible for leadership and occupies a certain high parliamentary party office should toe the line. My response is, fine, I'll resign from the post of chairman. Problem solved. Giving up my seat is another matter. That's got to be carefully considered. And I'm certainly not giving anything away when I say that my political allies back home were anything but pleased about that prospect. Some rightly say that the legislative period is only half over and I was elected for four years. Others say, we didn't elect you in spite of your position on Greece, but because of it. And you can't let us down. Other people in your party would be happy if you quit the chairmanship and gave up your seat, too. The CDU's general secretary calls your behavior and presence in the media a business model. Isn't it time to stop when your own people are taking pot shots at you? Well, I'm not going to let what the CDU General Secretary said influence me. I find that a completely absurd statement of opinion. He's got to defend it, but it doesn't impress me. Before, we had general secretaries who got into arguments with our political rivals. Today, they pick fights with their own political allies. I don't feel that's good for the party. But you've had much harsher words directed at you. Former Chancellery Minister Ronald Profala said, I'm sick at the sight of you, end of quote. How hard did that hit you? Not as hard as you might think, because it came straight at me, not from behind my back. He didn't go and tattle to the press or leak it or say off the record or something like that. It was a frontal assault. I can handle those well. He apologized the next day, and for me it was over and done with. It's worse for me when people run to the media, and people who say no are made to look like colleagues who constantly profile themselves. Then I get really upset, because it makes it look as if the people who say no haven't thought the whole thing through, as if they didn't have any real arguments, and are just doing it to be difficult, stubborn, or whatever. That means they're not addressing our arguments at all. 
They just want to discredit colleagues. For me, that's far worse than someone coming straight at you. Now we'd like to talk about something that you've made public. You have cancer, but you're still active in politics. How difficult is all of that for you, and how are you at the moment? I don't have pain or symptoms that prevent me from working. The treatment has side effects, and they're not great, but there are worse things. I follow the rules. I take the medication that I need. I never miss a doctor's appointment, and as long as it stays the way it is, I've got no complaints. Has your illness changed your viewpoint on things? For example, do some of the power games in Berlin now seem unimportant and secondary? You get more relaxed. Priorities change. Things that would have upset me several years ago might still bother me, but I just say, hey, you've got very different concerns. Why get all worked up about an article or TV program based on a lot of content invented by some journalist? You say priorities change. Which ones? Well, health, of course. You realize how important that is. And maybe family and friends who didn't see me often in recent years. I've got to consider whether I should travel less. I'm glad about every invitation I get, but for the organizer, it's just a couple of hours. For me, it often means trips that have me on the go 16, 18 hours a day. And I just can't do that anymore, unfortunately. You're talking about workloads. You've been an active, full-time politician for 40 years. Do you have a bad conscience when it comes to family, your daughters? Oh, it's not all that bad, because they've experienced many nice things that they wouldn't have if I hadn't been in politics. What really makes me quite regretful is that I can't go back and do what I missed. The big turning point was the Bundestag's move from Bonn to Berlin. Back then I could still sleep at home. I could bring my kids to kindergarten, later to school, and then I drove on into Bonn. And I came home again in the evening. The kids were already in bed, but we had breakfast together in the morning. The move from Bonn to Berlin put an end to all that. I was sorry about it, but I didn't vote on it myself. That was all decided before I entered the Bundestag. Policymakers who pursue that career, as you do, want to make an impact. Other politicians of your caliber would have long since become ministers. So why is it that you're not one? Is it because of you or Angela Merkel? Well, it's certainly not because of me. I would have liked to become one. And I had hopes that weren't flights of fancy, but were based on talks that I had back then. I'm talking about 2005. But it wasn't to be and life goes on. Anyone who believes I'm desperate or angry, that's all nonsense. I would have liked to have gotten the nod, but it didn't happen. I haven't gone less distance or gone slower as a result. I've worked just like I've always done. There's nothing I would rather do than what I'm doing now. And not everyone who would like to be a minister becomes one. Some say you only took on the role of party dissident out of disappointment. Is that just malicious gossip? That's not just malicious gossip. Kids would say it's downright mean. And it's nonsense. Because we're talking about 2005. If that argument were true, then I would have put my frustration on hold for six years, and then after those six years have said, now I'm going to act up. Why would I have voted for the first bailout package for Greece? That's often overlooked. I didn't say no from the start. I said yes to the first bailout. And then I said, this far and no further. There was lots of applause for the speech back then. It was the last time there was so much applause from the parliamentary party for a speech of mine about Greece. So if the arguments were true, then I would have had to vote no from the very beginning. Your party is your life? No, not at all. Nine? 
No, the party is an important part of my life, but it isn't my life. But the party has broken almost every single promise it's made with respect to Greece. There would be no Greek bailout package, no second package, no haircut, and there wouldn't be a third package now either. And the IMF isn't on board. How can you still promote this party? Yes, the lack of reliability is what bothers me most. I was already a member of parliament when we debated the introduction of the euro in the mid-1990s. We were still in bond back then. I know exactly what my party promised people about the introduction of the euro. And I still believe the commitments we made back then are correct now. But we're going to great lengths now to explain why everything has to be different. We're talking less about the economy, less about objective numbers, data and facts. It was that way at the start of the efforts to save the euro. Today it's about Europe, about geostrategic questions, about the larger picture. So the whole framework of the debate has shifted. Mr. Bosbach, we always conclude our interview with three incomplete statements. We ask our guests to finish them. With the billions we gave to Greece, we could instead have really helped Greece redevelop its economic strength after reverting to its own currency, so it could stand on its own two feet without us trying to dictate to the people of Greece how they should live. Angela Merkel's cabinet lacks nothing. I'll stay in politics as long as... As long as I can, and independent of whether I'm the head of the Internal Affairs Committee or a member of the Bundestag. I've always been interested in politics, and to shape policy you don't necessarily have to head a committee. Wolfgang Bosbach, thanks for joining us.